Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for rescuing us, Lord, for saving us, for setting us free. Lord, you gave your life for us, Lord. And we just, in our hearts now, give our lives back to you, Lord, to say, come and do a great and continuing work in our hearts and lives, Lord, as we are fruitful for your kingdom, as we spread the good news, the best news on planet Earth, Lord, that Jesus saves, that Jesus heals, that Jesus delivers, that Jesus makes whole, that Jesus came to bring salvation that we could be in heaven forever and ever and ever. Lord, we worship you. We adore you. You're beautiful, Jesus. What a beautiful name, Jesus. What a beautiful name, Jesus. <laughs> what a beautiful name. What a wonderful name. What a powerful name, Jesus. The name above every name. Hallelujah. Father, we're just so excited about 2022 and beyond, Lord. And as Vince comes, we just want to open our hearts, Lord, to hear what is on your heart through Vince and Cleo. Amen. Amen. Wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Praise God. Nigel, thank you for leading us so beautifully this morning, Seb, for your worship. Wasn't that great? Wasn't that good? Oh, welcome Hannah and your small group of friends that have added a third to our church this morning. You are so welcome, guys. You're really great. And Zoom people, it's lovely to have you with us. And I know some people are catching up later as well. Was there someone else, Claire? You were? Oh, I don't know. Well, I don't know. Do you know these people? <laughs> yeah, you do. Yeah, 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 yeah. She's owning up to them. That's a good sign. That's a good sign. My name's Vince. I lead the church with my lovely, beautiful wife, Cleo, um, and you're really, really welcome. Well, we are living in really exciting times, people, really, really exciting. I know that there's lots of stress and difficulty and stuff around, um, but spiritually, there's some really um, exciting things that are moving. And so at the beginning of the year, I thought it would be appropriate just to share a little bit of my heart um, for what lies ahead. Um, before we do that, I'll just recap very briefly, so blink and you'll miss it, but I'll recap a little bit about what is the sort of the DNA of this church, what is the, what is the prime mover, what is our, our vision, what is our identity, um, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, I'm going to unpack some stuff that's really exciting me at the moment, um, but just to catch you up, um, the, the key thing where we start with in this church is the presence of God. I'm not talking about the omnipresence, you know, there's no way you can go where he's not, but I'm talking about the manifest presence of God, where he can be felt, experienced, uh, sensed, because he's in the house. We had a, um, uh, a new age lady come into the hall and she said, what is the energy in this place? And I was able to explain to her that that energy was the person of the Holy Spirit. And I think when we are intentional about seeking him, seeking his presence, seeking to host his presence, then we don't just become a religious organization, but we become the living body of Christ on earth because we are spirit filled. And that is the key to me. Everything else comes out of the sense of his presence in us and through us, that his presence is what we covet, we love, we lean into. Um, and everything else we do comes after that we've had that encounter. We've encountered God. He changes us. Secondly, is that sense of him changing us. Not just experiencing him and having a, a supernatural touch, a sense of his glory. Not just stopping there, but letting that change us. Making us his disciples, becoming like Jesus. It sounds an audacious thing to say, but that is his heart for us. You know, there's one thing worse than broken, hurting people that damage the body of Christ, but it's anointed, broken, hurting people that hurt the body of Christ. You know, if we do not let his glory change us, if we don't deal with our stuff, if we don't resolve our issues, then we are a time bomb waiting to 
caused damage somewhere and the church is littered with great anointed times that have gone hopelessly wrong because people never got healed up they never got whole they never dealt with their stuff and i think healing is a core part of what this church is about it's been prophesied over the hall whether this is physical healing emotional healing spiritual healing but us becoming whole is a core part of what this church means to be you've got wonderful Stephen sue sitting here that do some fantastic counseling we've got the sozo stuff which sets people free but it is it's not okay to just press in and experience god without letting him change our very nature to become the people we were meant to be we're supposed to be radiators radiating the love of god not broken glass that people have to you know pick out their way around us will you let jesus really get hold of even those areas that you know you perhaps you prefer to forget or you don't want to deal with or whatever but becoming the people we're supposed to be is core and central to what we're supposed to be lastly i told you blink and you'd miss it lastly having encountered god having let him change us it doesn't stop there because this new identity has got to spill out and spill over and spill right into this broken, chaotic, hurting world. Unless we've got the presence of God, we've got nothing to take them other than just being a religious organization that can be well managed. Unless we've got the spirit of God, we've got no supernatural power to reach the lost, to, to heal the brokenhearted, yeah, to pour out. And it's thrilling when that happens and it's got to happen. But it is kind of, yeah, the order, yeah, you know, if you're a bit broken, doesn't stop you from working or whatever, and that can be part of your discipleship, part of your healing, I get all that. But that is what this church was birthed into and for. It started with our river meetings where we just wanted people to encounter the presence of God. Out of that, the church was birthed. So that's our kind of, you know, I said, Blink and you miss it. That's our three kind of stage strategy of what this church um, is about. Um, but I, I just wanted to share that there are, in terms of where we go in 2022, you know, there are lots of things that we can do, lots of things we can strategize where we're going to put our energy. But I realized I've been doing this business for quite a long time now. And if I'm to be totally honest, I don't get that excited about what we can do. You know, whether it's boredom, tiredness, or whatever, there are a lot of good things that we can do. Yeah, that's great. And we want to really facilitate and enable or whatever. But there is something that really gets my attention and really gets me excited. And I think, oh, that's worth living or dying for. And that's not the things that we can do. The things that excite me are the things that we can't do. The things that we can't do and only God can do. Now that's worth getting excited about because that dis gives us distinction between just another religious organization doing stuff. And that's great. And you can be well managed and you can have your smart goals here what is it, the, the um, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time-based or whatever, these are great management principles. And we should, you know, have those if we're trying to, to do anything. But I'm not so excited about what we can do. But when God starts working and does stuff that there is no way we could do, we start touching into the supernatural, the miraculous, God getting famous, then I think, oh, Oh, that's worth, that's worth leaning into. That's worth positioning yourself for. Because then we become the living body of Christ, spirit-filled, miracle-working, hell-breaking. And I think, come on. You know, Moses didn't have that many smart goals when he told the, this disparate slave people, well, what's, what, do, what do we do? How do we get hold of this vision, Moses? What do we, you know, what can, what can enables me to, well, we're just going to follow this pillar of fire by night and, you know, we're just going to go out into the desert. Where there's the, it wasn't that attainable, but they were following, they were following God. There's a verse in Romans that I read recently that kind of touched me. It wasn't particularly talking about this. It was talking about how you attain faith and righteousness before God. Um, but it kind of, intrigued me, scared me a bit, Romans 10, 3, since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God. And I think that can what sometimes will happen. Since they didn't know what God wanted and sought to establish their own. Since they didn't know the righteousness comes from God and sought to establish their own. And I think that's so easy for church to do. Since 
supernatural, the miraculous, the presence of God, the what we can't do is, is too difficult, then we fall back and we seek to establish our own, in this case, righteousness. And they didn't submit to God's righteousness. Since they didn't know the righteousness comes from God and sought to establish their own, they didn't submit to God's righteousness. And that's a scary verse because it's so easy for churches to do. Well, we can't do all that stuff, so let's fall back and do something that we can do. But if we do what we can do, then what distinguishes us from, you know, the new age health people in Axminster that run a food bank? You know, it's still giving out food to people that need it. I'm not saying that there's nothing, food banks are amazing and great and they started in Christianity, street pastors are great, Christians Against Poverty are great, we need all these things. But what we need more than that, above that, is the living presence of God that does what we can't do. Let's read the end of Mark, and we often don't read this because we're a bit embarrassed because it's got these verses at the top, or not these verses, this note, the most reliable early manuscripts and other ancient witnesses do not have Mark 16, 9 to 20. All right, so they don't have it. I looked into all this. This is a job of uh, textual criticism. Um, it almost certainly wasn't written by Mark. It almost certainly was an add-on, but it was a really, really early add-on that the people at the time, including Eusebius and others, were writing about what happened, is that they really consider it as part of scripture. So whoever wrote it, we do think that it's authentic and it's worth reading. And it was happening, yes. So uh, we get a bit embarrassed because it wasn't actually the real ending of Mark, um, but everyone says, look, you know, we don't know who wrote, wrote Hebrews, so um, we don't know who wrote this, but it's part of scripture. And it's a nice time for where we were finishing off last term. Uh, I'm reading from verse nine, just to show I'm a Christian. Um, got some Bible in there. When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, one of whom he had driven out seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him and who were mourning and weeping, weeping. When they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had not seen him, wait for it, she's seen him, they didn't believe it. Just park that, that doesn't work out too well for them. Meanwhile, Afterwards, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking in the country. They returned and reported it to the rest, but they didn't believe it either. <laughs> Park that, it doesn't work out well for them. Later, Jesus appeared to the 11, and there were some others there as well, we picked up on that, as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Note to self, be cautious to not believe um, incredulous stories of the supernatural and miraculous when they are reported, particularly if it's from a woman. Um, <laughs> listen, husbands, listen to your wives. He said to them, go into the whole world and preach the good news to all creation. You know, the story you carry is good news. You know, the church has managed to turn wine into water somehow they've managed to turn laughter into sorrow somehow um, but it's supposed to be good news for people wonderful liberating fantastic best ever news for people where people can become the people they're supposed to be not the people that sin has wrecked them to be it's supposed to be releasing and empowering and you don't get denuded of your personality and become some dry boring gray christian clone you have all the color and the life that God intended you to be, then empowered because the weights and the shackles of sin get broken off you and you can really live as you're supposed to live and be who you're supposed to be. It's good news, people, and people want to know it. Preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. That's pretty binary two choices wide road narrow road either you get saved or you don't and that's that's the condition that is the that is the gospel and these signs will accompany those who believe it doesn't say and these signs might accompany it doesn't say those who are particularly spiritual those that have studied lots of theology 
those that are very religious, it says those who believe. And if you believe, these signs will follow you. And this is what excites me. And this is what this church needs to be, to be people that believe Jesus, take him seriously. Do you know what? I don't think you need more of a revelation of God. I don't think you, I think you know who God is. I think you've had enough teaching, YouTube videos, anointed worship times. I think you appreciate the majesty and the magnitude and the glory of who God is. I think you need a revelation of who you are. Oh, good word. I think you need a revelation of who you are in him. Because if you could see who you were in him, not who your past, who your failures, who your mistakes, who your wrong turnings have led you to think you are. But if you really believed at that blood that we sang about that cleansed us from everything, and that spirit that empowers us for anything, and the authority that's given us to overcome every name that's been given, then we'd see transformation. The church has spent too long as saved sinners, humble saved sinners, grateful humble saved sinners. And that all those things are good and they are true. But it stops people knowing they are sanctified saints, they're anointed saints, that they have the government of his kingdom on the shoulders of the body of Christ. And that actually what you say matters, what you pray matters, what you release affects stuff because you're not junior and forgotten and insubstantial. You are senior and significant and anointed with the potential to release the kingdom of God on earth. If you partner with the Holy Spirit, nothing is impossible. And for so many years, we have kind of been disappointed at our ineffectiveness that we've pulled back and found a righteousness of our own. But God isn't interested in a righteousness of our own. He's got his own righteousness and he'd rather us partake of that. And it's a question of leaning in. And if you think, well, I, I, I've prayed for the sick loads of times and nothing happened, that is fantastic. You are in great company. Every wonderful, anointed, significant healing evangelist that's ever lived started out exactly the same way. They prayed for the sick and nothing happened. And then heaven, oh, 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 oh. then heaven broke out. Then heaven broke out. So if you really want to live for something that's worth living for, Go through the failure, don't give up, don't stop believing, and keep going, and seeing what your persistent widow determination releases from heaven into you. These signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. Well, we've done that. That's exciting. That's good. They will speak in new tongues. Done that. That's good. That's exciting. And if you don't, it's not that complicated. And you might well already actually have asked for it and just thought, oh, it's only me. Well, it is you speaking, but it's the spirit that gives utterance. So go with it and you'll find that this wonderful new prayer language gets released. So some of this is happening already. They will pick up snakes with their hands. Well, Paul did that, didn't he, on Malta? And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. Children, please don't try this at home, um, although that's what the word says. They will place their hands on sick people, and they'll get well. In the power of the Holy Spirit, they'll place their hands on sick people, and they'll get well. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven, and he sat at the right hand of God. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them, and confirmed his words by the signs that accompanied it. We're not chasing signs, but signs will follow us. And this world is dying to know reality. And if there was just a rumor that God was in the house, 
people would flock. I've seen it before. Sign of a miracle, something happening, people getting coach loads to visit and find what is going on. Revival is a historic phenomena. And I just was aware of the big ones, the Welch Revival, Azusa Street, these sorts of things, the Great Awakenings in America. But I was reading some revival history. And actually, there have been a plethora of big and small moves of God. And there's been times when the people of God have been living on the cusp of this little bubbling sense of the imminence of God and the, and the nearness of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's where I want to live really on the edge whether the big one happens or not as far as i'm concerned i can live in that place i can live in that atmosphere of expectancy for being a connection between heaven and earth and to pray lord your kingdom come your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven where there is no sickness and colds and corona and all the rest of it and to see an invasion of the powers of darkness and death, it is exactly what happened when Jesus came. There was, a, there was a Holy Spirit kingdom invasion on broken planet Earth, and the deaf saw and the lame walked, and the blind, the, sorry, the deaf heard and the blind saw and the lame walked, the poor heard the good news, the dead were raised, the lepers were cured. And what he did, he tells us to do. But just because we couldn't get hold of his righteousness as we made a one of our own? No. We hold out for what God has given to us. And it's happening, people. It is starting to happen. You know, even this last year, following the preaching of the word, backsliders, people that once remembered their faith in Jesus but had walked totally away from it, came right back home. That is wonderful. That is miraculous. Those that didn't know anything of Jesus but knew something, that there was something more, they came, they heard, and they were led to Christ. Some of these people, a couple I can think of, we've had very, very little contact with. Led them to Christ here. They've visited a few times. Christmas card from them. You have totally changed our lives. Well, I haven't, actually. <laughs> but Jesus has. You know, when the lost get saved and the sick start getting healed. So one of these backsliders came and did a, um, uh, a sozo with us, which is an amazing time, which allows the Holy Spirit to reveal things in their lives that you can't do. This is the stuff that excites me. You know, every time I've got a sozo, I come, oh, help, we've got a sozo, I've got to do this, I've got to do it, I'll do a sozo. After I've finished, I think, why do I bother doing anything else? That was so cool. Because it's the Holy Spirit that can reveal the issue that has led to a life under oppression, not life of freedom. I can't give them their early childhood trauma that has led them to believe stuff that isn't even true and set up a lifetime pattern of insignificance or rejection or hurt or whatever that's, that's stymied their, their spiritual life. And this is for Christians, people, but God can. But the really cool thing about this sozo wasn't the sozo, which was amazing, but afterwards, mum said... I have been going around with the vacuum cleaner, vacuuming up all the skin, all the dry skin that has fallen off his body. Because this guy was covered in the worst possible skin disease, eczema or whatever, I don't know quite what it was. Following his, and we didn't even pray for his skin. We just released the spirit of God over him. It's an, and his skin started falling away and this beautiful, fresh, new, beautiful skin emerged. I couldn't do that. That excites me. That excites me because that's God at work. Michelle talks about a lady that came that had terrible leg ulcers. They're all covered up, laid hands in the garden just in the summer. She reports back to me, you know they're healed, don't they? They're healed. I can't do that. Jesus can. You know, we know about Tyler, the little boy in hospital. Alex, Joe and I uh, zoomed in. Jonathan, thanks for that, Jonathan. Nice to know who your friends are. He zoomed us into this intensive care ward and we thought, okay, well, we're preparing this boy to die, aren't we? He was really agitated, really unwell, had leukemia and some other bits and pieces. Um, so I said to mum, you know, how would you like us to pray? And she said that he would be comfortable. And I thought, 
Phew, I can do that. At least I can pray for that. We prayed they'd be comfortable. He turned over and he fell asleep, which was amazing. Uh, we went on, Joe and Alex and I, we prayed and prophesied and released healing as best we knew how and over the family, staggered later that day. And we didn't know, I don't want to claim more, but he was up and playing football that we thought was intriguing, having seen him in the morning. Three times they have looked at his body to try and find leukemia. And they say his healing is astonishing. There is no leukemia in his body. Holy Spirit can do that. Now I can tell you lots of times when we pray for people and it hasn't worked and I want to be full of integrity. But for Tyler, for Tyler, heaven invaded earth and touched him. But I think very briefly, I want to talk a little bit more personally. That's something that's happened for me, um, which is which has just so encouraged me. You know, I've been watching a guy called Dave Hogan that is off the charts in terms of Christian experience and ministry, YouTube him. Uh, he just sees the dead raised to life. You know, that's just, a, you know, that's just normal for him. Um, extraordinary guy. He's, um, um, what's the word you use? You word savage. He's, um, he's, 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 he's released anyway. He knows who he is in Christ. But I've watched, I got deeply encouraged. But also I got encouraged by this. I have, since a ch being a child, had, a, had asthma. Um, it was, I was allergic to stuff, you know, house dust, house dust, my cat fur, dog fur, all the rest of it, had loads of injections. The syringes are really good afterwards, you use as water, water squirters, but I was just a little lad, and I grew up with this stuff. It was quite bad, it meant that whenever I was under exertion, I, I got totally wheezy. Mr. Miller, my prep school teacher, was very proud of me that I'd trog along at the back, and I never gave up, but wheezing away. One time I was taking an ambulance overnight to go and be put in an oxygen tent because I couldn't breathe properly. So it was kind of, it was quite, you know, I mean, I'd stopped doing rugby or whatever because I, you know, couldn't do this thing. So it's a big thing. I was always told I'd grow out of it. Um, and I sort of kind of did a bit, but if it was damp or dusty or moldy or whatever, I could really feel a tightness um, on, my, on my chest. Um, roll forward to, um, Revive Camp 94, possibly 95. This was the height of something called the Toronto Blessing. We were in a church called Ichthus Christian Fellowship, and we had it really big. Um, if you look at revival histories, you'll find places like HTB or whatever, and we were visited there, and there was definitely a move of definitely a move of God there. I think the Alpha Course prospered so much because it was a church that received the Toronto Blessing. Alpha Course was already running. Um, but it really took off after that. But anyway, Ichthys had it. We were kind of a rough church, um, not very religious, um, and we had the most extraordinary manifestations of the Holy Spirit. And we didn't know what to make of it, to be honest. We hadn't been there before. We, we thought, you know, is this allowed? Is this God? What, what's going on? And I remember Faith Forster on the platform in one of these worship times when it was all kicking off, saying, I don't want people to be alarmed because where the Holy Spirit is, the demons cannot stay. That's all she said. My breathing was fine until that moment. And when she said the demons cannot stay, I had an instantaneous severe asthma attack and started coughing up this stuff. And I believe I got delivered of a spirit of asthma. Some sicknesses are just sicknesses. Sometimes they are spirits of infirmity. And I, I literally coughed up and my lungs were clear. And it was amazing. I knew it was tied up with my father. And someone that was an experienced Christian, he said, oh, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's absolutely normal asthma in this. I've never heard of it before. Um, but as a young kid, I'd, he was a good man, my father. He loved us. He provided for us. Never, you know, did all the awful atrocities you find some fathers do, um, looked after us or whatever. But he had his own issues. He was a very angry man, um, very controlling. I said to him later in life, I said, Dad, you know, I used to be frightened of you when I was a kid. And he said, oh, aren't you anymore, which I thought was a little intriguing that he loved to have the control of his kids. But I really stood up and I knew that my lungs and standing up to my father were really, really linked. My mother used to sit on my bed when I'd be crying to bed, just as a really, really little, I don't know, three, four year old or whatever, saying, daddy does love you really, 
which to me makes me sound okay so it wasn't evidenced in his behavior towards me he'd obviously been i don't know smacking or shouting at me or whatever and i was traumatized bedwetted late or whatever and she would say he does love you really but i wonder whether i don't know but whether that that trauma or whatever allowed something of that of that spirit to, to come in to enter me but i got delivered and it was amazing it was fantastic roll forward till we get here and i realized that actually slowly slowly it was creeping back not all the time but i was thinking and i was kind of making allowances for it. i was thinking look the house is not the driest um it would be surprising if there weren't mold spools around um it's cold it's damp there's mold i've got a wood burning stove and there's smoke around and i was aware that i was getting wheezy in the evenings i could be set off um Stephen sue's dog would completely set it off if it wasn't even a million miles i went up to the living room to be that and there's just this wheezy i got a ventolin from the doctors been using it a couple of years when i needed to use it or whatever but i kind of put up with it i kind of thought oh well that's just you know it's just age and i live here or whatever but when we came to uh, the Healing Center Online's um, meeting we had in the hall here, I thought, well, actually, <laughs> we're talking about all this healing stuff. I've got this condition. I could get prayer, you know, good, I'm bright, me, no flies on me. I suddenly realized I'd get prayer for this. So I got prayer, a little bit of manifestation, and then somewhat incredulously, that evening, I sort of took a deep breath when normally there'd be this wheeze, my lungs were clear. And Laura said, how is it with your lungs? I said, um, yeah, I'm just waiting on it. I just want to see. I, I wonder if something might have happened. Day after day, when I'd get wheezy, I was absolutely clear. And I really clinched it when we went up on Christmas Eve to Steve and Sue's, where their dog normally, if it's another room, I would be set off and I'd have to have Ventolin. Well, they let it out, didn't they? And this overexcited polar bear on cocaine jumping around everywhere on me licking the furniture licking me on the sofa lungs completely clear alleluia alleluia so i know that god has now to be totally honest i did my little rowing thing and i, I did get a touch and i did use a ventilator so i want to be absolutely true that it's, it there is still a residual you know something there but i every time i take a breath i go oh, i'm clear i'm clear God did it for me. You know, sometimes there can be sort of such enthusiasm for telling testimonies, and we can be a little bit skeptical and incredulous. Well, did it, was it really like that? Are they trying to please us with their stories? But when it's you, you know that God has supernaturally done something for you to give me faith to pray for the sick and see them and see them healed. So this year. Let's be a people that get excited about what we can't do. Let's so choose to lean into what only God can do. And you think, well, how do I, how do, I do this? Uh, that's, that's not smart. That's not attainable. That's not, I don't know. I don't know. What did Moses say? He said, just, just follow. Follow God. Lean in. There is something about being intentional, hearing testimony, starting to believe a bit more positioning yourself in the place where you can be in the presence of god receive anointing getting a revelation of who you are not who the enemy thinks you are or who your parents think you are or your friends think you are but who god thinks you are or says you are and actually thinking together what that is already happening okay it's all i'm not talking about something that's a million miles off i'm talking about something that's already bubbling away and starting but if we were to lean in and say actually i'm a forgiven saint i'm anointed by the holy spirit i'm baptized in the holy spirit i've got deposit guaranteeing my intention guaranteeing my inheritance i've got authority i'm good news to the poor and you start being confidently sharing your faith looking for opportunities not to manipulate every conversation but to believe that you are partnering with the holy spirit you can't convict people of their sins if you do it's ugly and religious holy spirit can as you start talking about the goodness of god do you know what that leads to it leads to repentance people start to want to know what's about your life 
and not being ashamed to put your life on display and say, this is who I am and this is what I'm living for. There will come a time when your opportunity to be and do finishes because we all die and then we face judgment and we give account to God for our life. You know, I'm not saying that to scare people, but I'm just saying that's, that's how it is. But we've got a wonderful opportunity to encourage each other, to celebrate each other, to stir each other on for other things. You know, this church has got lots of room for lots of leaders because we're not jealous of stuff. And if people hive off and form their own ministries and other stuff and travel or whatever, we're going to celebrate it, not be threatened by it. You know, there was a time, I'll just tell it very briefly. Steve and Sue, they live up in the lodge here. Sorry if I keep on mentioning you. But Steve asked whether he could do something here or whatever, and it was it's to do with their ministry. And I thought, yeah, that, that, that's fine. And then Tim came along, and he was wanting to do something else and, and use the place or whatever. And I was making coffee one morning, and I was moving towards the fridge, um, and I was complaining to God. Actually, I was. I was, I was saying... Lord, I'm really happy for these people to have their ministries and, and stuff and for us to facilitate that and, that, and that's all fine. But, you know, I, I, I don't just want to be enabling other people's ministries. There's got to be something here for us. We've got to enable, facilitate, you know, it has got to be something of what we're doing, not just, not just enabling other Christian work or whatever. And God, it was so gentle. He just raised his eyebrow at me and he said, uh-huh. Okay, so you don't think Christian leadership's about empowering other people? Okay, Vince, okay, so, so what do you think it is? And I had to repent really quickly. I had to repent, you know? Because we want you to do so well and overtake us and release heaven on earth and see the deaf healed and the blind seeing and the lame walking and the skin diseases falling off and other stuff but also people being irradiated by the love of God and coming back to their true purpose. Being in a place of love where we're radiating goodness. Father, we thank you for the kingdom of God. We thank you that it's at hand. Thank you that it's a beautiful kingdom. It's a kingdom of wholeness and healing and well-being and peace and shalom and success and provision and glory and enjoyment and joy and dancing and happiness. Oh, hallelujah. Lord, we celebrate your kingdom. Thank you, Lord, that you are right at the center. Your beautiful presence beautifying everything else. And Lord, we say as far as it is up to us and our house, we will serve the Lord. We will serve you, Lord. We will seek your kingdom first. We don't do what we think we can do, but we'll see, look to see what we can only do if you work through us. We say, come, Lord Jesus. Give us a revelation of who we should be in you. Give us confidence to throw off all that hinders. Throw it off. Believe you for the more. In Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen.